welcome back to the Lightning Podcast. Over the last few episodes, we've been going through 1 Samuel chapter 17. Last time we saw that David was eager to find out what would be given to the man who killed Goliath. And we saw his brother Eliab, because of his jealousy and insecurity and pride, try to rebuke David and spewed all this kind of hate towards his own brother. But we learned David was by no means intimidated by Goliath. He certainly wasn't going to be intimidated by his brother. And so he continued on asking everyone, what's the reward for killing this man? And we touched upon just briefly how confident David was that he could kill this man, that he wasn't even worried about that. He was instead enticed by the reward that Saul was offering. And we said we're going to find out why he was so confident, and we're going to learn about that today. Looking at 1 Samuel chapter 17, this is verses 31 through 32. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So once again, we see tremendous confidence by David to go fight the Philistine. Remember how the Bible described Goliath. He was massive. He was over nine feet tall. He was covered in all this impressive bronze armor. He had a shield bearer walking ahead of him, all these weapons. You find out later on he has this massive sword. But yet David, seeing him, he has no problem. He even tells the king, who is a great warrior for years, don't worry, I'm going to take care of this. So again, there's, there's no fear in David's heart. It's almost like it's, it's a done deal. He knows he's going to do it. Now, why is that? Well, let's look at Saul's reaction. In verse 33, he says what is pretty typical from an earthly perspective. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. So once again, Saul is looking at things from an earthly perspective. This is a big part of his failure. He was always looking for the approval of men, the acceptance of men. When you have that mindset, you're always looking at earthly things. You're judging things according to the flesh. Paul warns about this in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Do not look at things and think about things from earthly wisdom, earthly perspective. Instead... Look at things spiritually, from a biblical, uh, godly point of view. Looking at things through the eyes of faith. At this point in Saul's life, as we said, he's in this downward uh, decline because of his sin, because of his disobedience. And here we see he has great love for David. His reaction's not the same as Eliab, who sadly may not even loved his brother. He was concerned for David. But because he was looking at things from this earthly perspective, judging David by the outward appearance, you're a young man, and this guy has been a warrior since he was a young man, he thought, you're not going to be able to defeat him. Now imagine that. David has great love for Saul. We find out years later throughout his life, he has nothing but respect for Saul. And he's the king. And he tells him, your servant, he's submitting to the king's authority. But yet even then, he's not intimidated by what Saul says. Because we find out why David has such confidence in the next passage. Verse 34. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came out and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistines will be like one of them, seeing as he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So we see David's own words, this little mini-sermon, so to speak, convicted Saul, and he realized almost, oh, wait a minute, (laughs) we're children of the God. The Lord Almighty is our God. Maybe it'll actually work out. And this is the confidence David had to go fight this massive soldier. He wasn't doing this because he was 
confident in his own abilities. He was a, a shepherd boy. He didn't have all this experience of war. We know that he was respected as a valiant man, but again, he's still a youth. He hasn't done all the things that Goliath has done. The reason why he was so confident is because he's seen God work in his life in the past, and knowing that his God does not change, God will be with him in the future. You see this amazing story, and this contradicts the types of things that Eliab was saying about him, because being a shepherd apparently is extremely dangerous, because he was looking after the sheep, seems like an easy job, but on two occasions, huge animals came to steal the flock, a lion and a bear. Now, I don't know about you, but if a lion or a bear came after my sheep, I don't know what I would do. Thankfully, in this day and age, I'd probably have a rifle and just scare the bear away or the lion or to shoot it. Hopefully that it'll drop. Of course, that would probably scatter the sheep, so that's not even that useful. But David wasn't afraid. He rushed after the lion and the bear, grabbed it by its hair, and struck it dead. So it wasn't even like he was trying to shoot it with arrows from far away or something. He got up close to these animals, ferocious animals, bigger than him, stronger than him, and killed them. He says it right here, The Lord who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. So clearly we see David's confidence was in the Lord. And there's a powerful lesson for us in this. Those previous experiences were no doubt trials. David in his natural mind would have been probably sweating and terrified, pumping full of adrenaline. Not knowing what he should have done. These animals were coming for the sheep, his father's sheep. He couldn't just let them get away. So he rushed out, risking his life, but in confidence that the Lord would protect him. Because the Lord delivered him, he grew in his faith. He understood when there was a need, when there was a problem, God would be the one to deliver him. And notice how consistent this is with the rest of Scripture. David by no means had the power to kill a lion or a bear with his bare hands. Even if he had a club, he still had to grab the animal with one hand. Imagine how scary that was, a snarling lion, a roaring bear grabbing it up close and killing it. And before that, he says he was able to pull the lamb out of the animal's mouth and then kill it. There's no way a human being could do this. I don't care who you are. I don't care how strong you are. You're not killing a bear with your bare hands or a lion. The claws were enough to tear to shreds. A bear can destroy a human being. They're extremely powerful. So what does this tell us? At first, you might think David is doing the thing we've warned against throughout this entire study of 1 Samuel, rushing in, trying to fix a problem himself. Remember, way back in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we talked about how Elkanah was trying to fix his problem in his own efforts. His wife, Hannah, was barren, so he married a second wife to have his children. And we pointed out, you go back and listen to that first episode, we pointed out that that was him. Although he was this very religious, devout Israelite going to the temple every year, or tabernacle every year to worship, when it came to his personal problems, he was trying to fix it himself. And we pointed out how it didn't work. When we try to fix our problems in our own effort, relying on our own abilities, our own understanding, we fail. And we saw, in contrast, Hannah who had no means to fix her problem herself, because she herself was barren, instead turned to the Lord and cried out to him, and prayed and asked him for the deliverance, for the answer that she was needing. So we see the very very clear difference between Elkanah and Hannah. If you try to fix your problems yourself in your own flesh, you will fail. But when you turn to the Lord and seek his help, He will answer. That's straight out of Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So it might look like David is doing the opposite. He's rushing out to attack these animals, to save the the sheep, to do in his own power what he thinks he needs to do. But if we understand the context especially what he says at the end, we know that he's not doing anything in his own strength because we know nobody in their own power can kill a bear. And we know David was not a foolish young man. He was very prudent. 
He was praised by Saul's servant in the last chapter for being skilled and eloquent, and we could interpret from the praise a wise young man. He was a man after God's own heart. He could not have not been wise. When he rushed out to save those sheep, he wasn't doing it logically. This wasn't what our natural flesh would want to do. Who among us is going to say, you know what? I'm going to go kill that lion. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Or his own natural inclination would have been, oh no, we just lost a sheep because I'm not going to go get killed by a lion. And even if he asked his father, his father would probably said, don't risk your life for a lamb. You're more valuable to me than a lamb. So clearly from this context, we see that what David did was defying what our natural inclination would have been. Unless you had some sort of powerful weapon, like a gun, you wouldn't have risked your life against a lion or a bear. Of course, David didn't have a gun. So the fact that he rushed out, physically rescued the lamb, and then killed these animals with his bare hands shows that the Lord was working through him. This is actually reminiscent of what Samson did back in the book of Judges. He was able to kill animals with his bare hands and then, with the jawbone of those dead animals, kill a bunch of human beings. It was supernatural power that God was giving him. So we see from this situation, David was rushing out to do what he knew God wanted him to do. Go rescue these lambs. Because he knew if he did nothing and those animals got away with that lamb, guess what would happen the next day and the day after that? And if he kept letting these animals come and eat the lambs, there wouldn't be any sheep left and his family would have been destitute. So it was incumbent upon David to defeat these animals, kill them immediately, eliminate the threat, and make sure not a single lamb was lost. But the question goes back to how could he do this on his own? And this is a very powerful lesson when it comes to stepping out in faith. Now, hopefully, thankfully, very few of us will have to kill a lion or a bear in our lifetime. Now, if you grew up in a rural part of the world, maybe that's something you had to do, but thankfully you probably had a rifle to take care of it. But regardless of your background, I'm a city boy, so I've encountered very few lions and bears in my life. Regardless of our backgrounds, there will be trials and challenges. There will be work that God wants us to do. There will be things he wants us to accomplish for his kingdom, for his purposes, to bring glory to him, to help other people that we will in no way be qualified to do in our own flesh. My mind thinks back to the need in John and all the Gospels where there is 5,000 plus people listening to Jesus and they haven't eaten in three days and Jesus tells the disciples, you feed them. And John says he did this to test them because he knew what he was going to do. And the apostles said, all we have are five loaves and two fish, which we got from this boy. That was it. How are we supposed to feed potentially 20,000 people when you counted the wives and the children with a pathetically small amount of food? That really wasn't enough for one family. But yet they gave Jesus what they had, and then Jesus, by his power, multiplied it and met the need. That illustrates this principle. When we step out in faith to do the thing we know God wants us to do, We give God what little we have, what little ability we have, and then we trust by his grace that he will supply what is really needed. David did not have the power to kill a lion or a bear. I know some of you may have grown up in Sunday school thinking, David was amazing, he killed lions and bears. David was a boy, probably in his late teens. He did not have the strength to kill a bear. We know he was an impressive young man, but he could not do that on his own. But out of faith, he went to rescue those lambs, trusting that God would deliver him. And he says that much in verse 37. The same thing is illustrated in the feeding of the 5,000 and then the 4,000. The disciples gave Jesus what little they had, but something that was not even remotely capable of meeting the need. And then God provided the rest. Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 when talking about his ministry as an apostle and the ministry of a man named Apollos who was an evangelist and teacher. He said, I sowed the seed, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And he said, it's not the one who sows the seed or the one who waters that matters, but it's God who gives the growth. That's the same principle. 
Paul was a great preacher, a great apostle, but he didn't do it alone. He would preach in different cities, and then we heard Apollos would come and preach and teach, and then there were other preachers and teachers in the church, Peter, Barnabas, many others. But Paul said, we are just servants. We are just doing our part. It's God who gives the growth. So if it, God wasn't involved, Paul could have been preaching every day from morning to sunset, wasting his breath till he went hoarse, and nobody would have been saved. Nobody would have believed in Christ. There would have been no church in those cities. But because God took what little Paul offered and what little Apollos offered, he caused the growth. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, Paul recounts the time he first met that people. And he said, I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. That's crazy to think about if you're familiar with the work of Paul. This man was a very bold preacher. In Acts 17, he spoke before the entire council of Athenian wise men, and he boldly proclaimed the gospel. He was not a shy man by any means, but yet when he went to Corinth, for whatever circumstances were affecting him, he, was, he came in weakness. He didn't come in great boldness. He said, I didn't use articulate, eloquent words of human wisdom. But what happened? Why did they believe? Because he came with a demonstration of the Spirit and power. And he said, this was done deliberately so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So again, we see the same pattern worked out. Paul saw the need. He was sent by God to Corinth. He knew he needed to preach to them. For whatever reason, he wasn't up to the task physically. Maybe he was sick. Maybe he had just been beaten and released from prison. Or maybe he was simply using dramatic language to communicate the humility that he came with when he preached. But regardless of the situation, he clearly said he was not fit to win these people over. But the power of God's Holy Spirit was with Paul as he preached. And the people saw the signs and the wonders and the healings. They would have been convicted in their spirits by the message being preached because it was the word of God. And because God was with Paul, because God was working through Paul, they believed in Jesus. This is the principle that is being taught here in 1 Samuel 17. David was able to kill the lion and bear, not because of any power that he had, and not because he was confident that he could kill a lion or a bear. He ran out to rescue the lambs, confident that the Lord would deliver him. In the moment, he may not even knew what he was going to do. He was saying, okay, I'm going to grab the lamb, and then I don't know what heck's going to happen. And then the, the lion or the bear turns on him, furious that he just took their meal. And so he just did what he, he had available to him. He just grabbed the animal and struck him. He wouldn't have had enough force to kill it, but God saved him. Let's think back to Moses in Exodus when God sends him back to Egypt. He says, what's in your hand? Moses says, well, a staff. And God used that staff to perform many, many miracles. This is an important principle that we could hold on to. What is in your hand? What do you have at your disposal? Well, not much. How can a man deliver an entire people from slavery with a stick? Do you ever think about that? There's no way a man can do anything with just a stick. There's no way David could kill a lion or bear with just his bare hands. There's no way Paul, in weakness and fear, can convince a group of Greeks that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There's no way the disciples could feed thousands of people with a small few pieces of food. But in every situation, they gave what little they had to God and trusted that the Lord would supply the rest. And in all those cases, the Lord supplied tremendously more than what they offered him. As it says in Ephesians, to him who is able to do abundantly above and beyond all we can ask or think. This is how God works through our life. And this is the principle of grace. We say grace means we're saved by grace through faith. We didn't earn forgiveness of sins and eternal life by our works. And that is true. That is grace. But there's much more to grace than salvation. Grace is what we stand upon. According to Romans 5, it says, By faith we've entered this grace by which we stand. 
Our entire relationship with God is founded upon grace. And this is one of the principles of grace. God's power is made real in our weakness, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Grace operates through our weakness because grace is undeserved favor. Undeserved, meaning we have God's favor, his goodness, his good opinion of us, his approval, his love, his support, not because of anything we've done, not because of how great our faith is. Our faith is tiny, not because of how much Bible we read, not because of how much we pray, not because of all the good works we do, not because we've witnessed to everyone we know, not because we go to church every Sunday and Wednesday night, we're there when the doors open, not because we give lots of money to church. That is not how we gain God's approval. We have God's approval because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the tree. He suffered and died in our place and then rose again to bring us this new life. Because of what he did, we have this unearnable favor from God. And because it's been provided for us by Jesus, the perfect one, we can never lose it. But grace is best realized within us in our weaknesses. Because if it's God providing for us what we cannot provide for ourselves, when we are weak, we are at the best place to recognize we can't do it ourselves. Does that make sense? I'll say it again. If grace is supplying what we cannot supply for ourselves, when we are weak, when we are inefficient, when we know we cannot do the job, is when we are best able to recognize and realize the grace of God in our lives. And all the examples I mentioned from Scripture are perfect examples of God's grace supplying what that person did not have. Even in the Old Covenant, there was grace everywhere. We tend to think New Covenant grace, Old Covenant law. Yes, they had the law. That was the basis of their covenant. But if it weren't for grace, David would not have survived. Moses would not have thrived. Neither would have Samuel, or Solomon, or Elijah, or any of the wonderful people we know about in the Bible. Grace was still there, because the blood of bulls and goats do not cover sin, as it says in Hebrews. So even under that covenant, there is so much grace. But now we have a grace that can be multiplied to us, as Peter says in First and Second Peter, because of the finished work of Jesus. And our entire relationship with God is based on that grace. And because David stepped out in faith, trusting in the provision that God would supply through his power, because Moses knew a stick couldn't deliver an entire people, because the disciples knew bread could not feed all those people, because Paul knew in his weakness he could not win over the Corinthians, God had to do it. And if God does it, it's because of his favor on our life that we did not earn. You might say to yourself, well, They earned it, right? Because they stepped out and did this thing. So that is what enabled God to do it. But that's not true. That's not how works are. Works or law means you do this and then God's obligated to answer you. Works under the law are like wages. You do this for God and now he has to pay you back. He owes you something. That is justification by works or what we call works of the flesh or dead works you have to earn it and now god has to pay you you've done something for god now he's obligated to pay you back but when we step out in faith there is no obligation on god's part to answer us like we said we could look at david's actions here and say what an idiot how presumptuous of him to run out after a lion or bear thinking that he could kill it God's not obligated to do anything in those circumstances if it was done in the flesh. When we step out in faith, in all the examples I've mentioned, Moses, David, the disciples, Paul, none of those examples are people earning something from God because the circumstances dictate there is nothing they could do to accomplish the work that God is calling them to do. So it is necessary for God to supply what is actually needed in order for them to be successful. By that very definition, it must be done by grace, because they can't do it themselves. If they could do it themselves, it's not grace, it's simply a work in the flesh. So them stepping out in faith 
is not them earning a supply from God. You can't earn anything from God. You could simply trust in the grace that he provides because of what he's done for you, according to what he tells us in his word. So when we step out in faith to do something for God, knowing we do not have what it takes to accomplish it, we are doing it as an expression of our confidence in who he is. Confidence in what he will do and has done for us. This is the heart of grace. Trusting in God, not in ourselves. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, we were brought to the point of death so that we would not trust in ourselves, but God who raised the dead. There will be times, my friend, where you will be brought to a point where you will say, I can't do anything about this. I have no idea what to do. I tried all I could to address this problem. It could be an external problem. It could be in an internal problem with yourself. And you could say, everything I did did not work. I cannot do this. And that is by God's design, because he wants you to turn to him and say, God, you have to be my deliverer or I'm not going to survive. You have to be the one that will pull me up or I will sink. When you reach that point, my friend, you will see the grace of God revealed in your life. Because you're not trusting in yourself anymore, but in God who raises the dead. Not just physical death, but in every area of our life where we struggle, where we will die without help, God is the one who supplies the help. So there'll be situations in your life, there'll be needs, crises, problems, where you know you don't have what it takes. And they might not even be problems, they might just be chores or responsibilities or ministry you might find yourself asked, can you teach this Sunday morning? Or asked, can you run this Bible study? Or teach our youth? Or help out at the children's church? Or lead this outreach? And you might be thinking, no, I can't. I can't do any of those things. But you know in your spirit that this is something that God wants you to do. So you step out in faith and say, God, I will do this, knowing that you are the one who's going to provide for me the wisdom the ability, the knowledge, the words, whatever it is, I'm going to give you what little I have myself, <laughs> these two arms and two legs, and I'm trusting that you are the one that's going to meet the need. There are people out there who need help. David was doing this for all of Israel. He wasn't doing it for himself. Moses did it to deliver the Israelites from captivity. The disciples needed to feed those thousands of people. Paul went out to help the people at Corinth. You see, in these examples, it's really not about the person. It's about a much larger need. But when we step out and do and say, God, I am inefficient, but you, you take these loaves and fishes of my life, take them and use them to meet the need. You must be the one who will come and be my deliverer, who will speak to the hard-hearted people I'm witnessing to who will supply the need that I can't meet, who will minister to these people at this church or at this outreach event, because I can't do it. I'll step out. I'll open my mouth. I'll reach out my hands. I'll do the work. But you are the one who's going to supply the growth, the increase, the fruit. That's the only time that fruit comes. That's the only time we get our answers. And because David experienced that through his life, he knew this Philistine was no different than that nasty bear or lion. And he knew that the same God would deliver him from Goliath like he did every other time. Because David wasn't going out there confident that he had the power to kill Goliath. He was confident that the Lord would be the one who would deliver him. And because of that, as we see, an amazing thing happens. God accomplishes an extraordinary work through David and the entire nation is delivered. But we'll learn about that next time. Thank you for listening to Lightning Podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Also check out our website, lightningpodcast.org.